Oh, that's a fun sound, isn't it, folks? You know you're in for a treat when you hear that because it's time for another edition of the Rec Poker Podcast Forums Edition. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Serini in the home games and at Hold'em underscore Steelers on Twitter. I'm happy to be joined here by a panel of wizards just like every week. Um, I'm going to thank our sponsors just like every week, Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino and website AMP. We are uh, here. We're playing in the nightly home game. We're trying to take chips off each other. Just like every week, we're pulling a post from the forums, and we're going to talk about it. And to talk about it with me this week, I am joined by Chris Jones. Uh, I am Chris Jones. I'm 5 by 5 on Poker Stars and Twitter. I am John Somsky. I'm Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Radman50 everywhere. Thanks, guys. I'm excited to be here talking poker. Um, I'm actually not playing in the rec poker home game tonight, but it, I, it's because I'm saving all my focus right here for this extremely uh, fierce debate and conversation that we're going to have about theory questions on a monotone board. So we're actually looking at a post by the one and only 5x5 five five himself, the resident content man director here, uh, Chris Jones. <laughs> and uh, just to, so I'll just paint the picture here for our audience. Um, we are going to look at a monotone flop where we hold five different hand combinations. And we're going to see how our action and the action of our opponents gets changed um, by various factors of this hand. So in every case, we're going to be playing out of position. We're going to have uh, 50 big blinds effective. And we're going to be dealing with a flop of queen of hearts, seven of hearts, six of hearts. And uh, we're mostly going to be looking at the turn here. So we're going to, we're going to, the question we're really getting down into here is when it has gone check, check on the flop on a monotone board with these holdings, how do we proceed? Because here at Rec Poker, this is, this is the kind of rabbit hole we like to fall down here a little bit. So um, Chris, you made this great post and you kind of pick these hands for a reason. Do you want to take us through the different options here and how we should take a, a look at it? Yeah, I mean, I guess the reason I uh, posted this is I've, I've found myself in these spots a few times uh, recently where, number one, monotone flops, I think, are, are hard to play. But then number two, uh, what I've noticed um, is that when I'm out of position, they're even harder to play when it checks through. Um, so... Uh, you know, and I'm on a monotone board out of position. I'm, we can talk about leading, but I am very rarely leading into this board. Um, so again, we have a queen, seven, six, all heart board. Um, and sort of the five uh, examples that I threw out uh, for uh, us to think about, or what, how would we approach this after it checks through and we get to a turn is if we had queen of spades, 10 of diamonds. So we've got um, top pair, but no heart. Uh, the second where we hit the king high flush, we have a king deuce of hearts. So we've got almost the nuts. Um, the third example is where we have the eight five of hearts. So now we have kind of a baby flush, but we're also drawing to that straight flush equity if we need it. Um, and uh, the fourth example is where we have the ace of hearts and the eight of spades. So we have the nut flush draw. And then um, in this example, uh, we said the turn was the three of clubs. And this, the fifth one is actually the spot where I found myself in, uh, which made me think about this a lot, which is that the turn was the three of clubs and I'm sitting there with three of diamonds, three of spades. So I, I turn a set on this monotone board. Now, now what? You know, I'm first to act. Do I lead out? Do I check? Do I try to, with the intention of check raising, which of these am I using as check raises? Which of these are check calls? Which of these are leads? Um, it's a really, I think, a confusing spot to like kind of think about. Um, so I did do a little bit of solver work. I don't know if we want to talk about that first or talk about our reactions first. Well, let me just jump in. And so just for our listening audience, uh, again, the flop is queen of hearts, seven of hearts, six of hearts. And in the different five spots, in the first one, we've got top pair. The second one, it's a big uh, flush. In the third one, it's a medium flush. In the fourth one, it's the ace blocker. And in the fifth one, it's the set on the turn. Um, 
And I encourage all our listeners to go to rec.poker and sign up for a free community account. You can go look at these forum posts yourself. Take your time. There's a lot of data in there. We're going to kind of pick the best of it for this conversation. But stuff like this, you can really get a lot out of it by uh, going to the forum post itself. So the, when when I look at these, I think of what what is the river going to bring? You know, what are the kinds of hands that my opponent's going to have when they choose to check the flop? Because these monotone flops, they're spots where I find people overfold. So um, I'm I'm always tempted when I'm in position with the initiative to put a small bet out there and just see if I can elicit some folds. Um, so when they don't do that, that sort of affects my thinking a bit about what they might have. That's one factor I'd be thinking about here. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the actual hands themselves, um, so it went check, check on the flop. We're considering which hands do we lead with and then which ones, when we check, do we have action uh, behind for? So I'm, I'm definitely checking the queen 10 here that has the top pair, no real redraw. That feels like I'm in the condensed part of my range, as I'm sure Rob would jump in to say, the, our book study guru. Uh, so I'm going to want to be in sort of pot control mode. And both the hearts are really, in, both the flushes are really interesting, I think, because out of position, you know, it's hard to get paid with these value hands, especially on scary flops like this. So that's where I'm the least sure, I think. What, what about you guys? Well, I'm thinking that on the... On the flush ones, I think you're, you know, already the the guy with the initiative has shown that he's not real interested by checking back the flop. So when are you going to get paid? Um, you're not going to, you're probably not going to get paid on the river. You know, if you go check and he checks back, whatever's in the pot, that's what you're going to get. So the turn is where you're going to need to try to gain some value. So especially on those two, um, where you've already got the flush, I think it's important to get some money invested in the pot. And I would almost say that if you got that set of threes, that last hand, that that's another opportunity that, again, if you, if you check and he checks back, the action on the river is going to be, you know, little or nothing. So it's, this is your opportunity to get some value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we're probably checking the flop 100% of the time anyway, so that's a good uh, feature to, to dial into this. Um, I, I kind of feel like I'd want to be leading some bluffs here, given that he checked behind, kind of like Rob's saying. He's kind of capping his range a little bit uh, by not making an aggressive action there. So... I would be inclined to lead with the ace of hearts blocker hand, even though it has, I mean, it has an ace high showdown value. So that's something, but really the power in the ace of hearts is that it's a redraw to the nuts and that it's a hand that your opponent can no longer have the nut flush. So I just feel like that ace of hearts, eight of spades hands, even though it's the weakest hand on the board, I feel like it's the one that I would be most inclined to use in an aggressive fashion, either by leading or check raising. And, and it turns out that there are some interesting results when it, when it comes to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like, if, if I, if you want me to go into this, like I, I'm not necessarily, I don't, you know, and a reminder um, solvers are not like sort of written in stone solutions. They are, uh, what a computer uh, approximates when it it thinks that your opponent is playing absolutely optimally. This is the strategy it would implement to balance that out. That is what a solver is telling you. So it's not necessarily that the solver is giving you an ans the answer. It's giving you the optimal way to play versus uh, an un an infallible opponent. So. Um, with that in mind, so not so we shouldn't just take this as like now these are the right answers, right? Uh, we need to think about these things for our for our own perspective. But with that in mind, I do think that when I ran this into the solver, it was surprising to me. Um, the solver does not lead very often at all. In fact, it does not lead any of the example hands 
that um, we had. The, the leads that, that it has in this uh, board are specifically hands like Ace Queen. Um, it leads. Uh, it doesn't care if it has a, the heart, the Ace of Hearts. Um, it's, it's almost always leading Ace Queen. And it's leading hands like 9 8. Uh, so that have the sort of the open-ended straight draw, um, some hands that, you know, probably have uh, very little showdown value um, and, uh, you know, but have a draw to something. Um, but it is it is very rarely leading these flushes. It's using those more as check raises. It's very rarely leading the queen 10. Uh, it's very rarely leading um, the ace of heart, eight of spades. Um, and it is sometimes leading the threes, but it much more prefers to lead the threes if it has the three of hearts. So hmm. we have the three of diamonds, three of spades. Um, it likes leading when you have the three of diamonds, three of hearts, because you blo that one card, I guess, gives you the blocker effect to, to block some of the flushes. So that's enough to guess tip it into the balance of leading. Um, and it likes the flushes primarily the king of the king of hearts is almost always a check raise. And the eight five of hearts is uh, it's, it's checked most of the time, but it is uh, sometimes check raised and sometimes check called. Uh, I don't know for the life of me, how you decide that in real time. <laughs> Um, but it was about a 65 to 35 percent split is the way it was it was um, um, breaking it down. Um, I found that really surprising. I found this particularly I know that once my opponent shows no initiative, we have this blank on the turn and I am sitting there with just basically ace high, but the ace of hearts in my hand. That is a that is a. That is a uh, hand that I am almost universally leading on on this board, and it's really made me rethink how I want to approach these kind of spots a little bit. But it still could be the right play. Yeah, um, it does depend even on your what the solver says. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so also, also the opponents that you're up against, and what are they doing in this hand, and what kind types of hands are they checking on the flop and and what are you do you expect them to do against your uh, action on the on the turn? Because these guys are not playing GTO poker, right? Right. They're playing uh, off the cuff. They're just thinking, okay, this is what I have. They're not thinking about your range, other than hey, there's a bunch of hearts on the board, so my opponent probably has hearts, and I'm dead. Because <laughs> you, know, you know that's the mentality, right? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I was really surprised that they don't want you to play that Ace of Hearts blocker hand more aggressively. Like that, I was really surprised that the the suit of the three mattered a great deal, but that the suit of the Ace didn't matter when you had top pair top kicker. And I don't know if that's because you're already ahead, but it's with a set of threes that that heart matters. So I feel like you're already ahead of all the hands that you would right. beat. Right. right, like you're already ahead of all the hands you would beat with a with a flush that had a three in it, with your set, aren't you? That's weird. Well, you're not you're not ahead of any of the flushes. No, but right. you wouldn't be with the three high flush either if you made it. You know what I mean? Oh, I think it's because you're you block your opponent from potentially having the flush. Yes, yes. So it's just the, so, them having so fewer combos right, in it. Right. Um. So I yeah, guess you're the, not hoping to draw to that. You're not right. hoping a fourth heart comes. <laughs> right. But then but then I'm surprised that the corollary when you have the ace of hearts or the ace queen situation, you said um it doesn't seem to care whether that ace is the ace of hearts. I, I'm mm -hmm. still I'm perplexed about that. John, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> the ace queen one I understand a little bit more. It, what was the strategy it had for the ace queen that was almost always a raise? It's almost always a lead. On this turn, regardless of whether you have the ace of hearts. So that's basically saying that the ace is strong enough to make it a lead, and you've just made your hand stronger, so that doesn't really matter at, at that point. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I understand that one. What it, I'm trying to figure out is what is going on, why it doesn't want to semi-bluff the Ace of Hearts. Mm-hmm. And have you come up with any and, rationale? And by the way, I looked at this. So it um, it does want to semi-bluff when you have ace ace of hearts five four three two it does not want to semi bluff when you have ace of hearts uh, basically between the jack and the the eight i guess because those have uh maybe because they can draw if your if your opponent is sitting there with a six or a seven, maybe because we can draw to our our eight or our nine, or if you know if we have ace nine or we have ace eight, or we have ace ten, we can draw to that second card still. Whereas it becomes more of a bluff in the solver's mind, or I or whatever it whatever it uses to make these decisions, um, when we have the when our second card is lower than the bottom card on the flop. Mm-hmm. Um, which I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I can follow the logic, um, but it's interesting. I, I, so I would like, that eight is enough to give you just enough equity that he doesn't want to bluff it away, or right. she. I guess. I right. Assume. Right. Yes. Hmm. I mean that. That's how I was interpreting it. Um, in, in real time, I still think. Maybe I'm over bluffing at this point. If I if I bluff every ace of hearts that I have, every lone ace of hearts that I have, um, maybe I'm over bluffing. Um, because remember, this was a late position open, so um, we're we're probably we're probably have if not all most of the aces in our range. So maybe we're over bluffing if we have all the ace of hearts. Uh, following through on this turn. Just because we're continuing with a lot of them as calls pre-flop, you mean? Like we're just getting into the spot with a lot of those aces? Yeah, we're probably calling with close to 100%, mm-hmm. you know, at least 90%. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Hmm. I guess, I mean, they are... Yeah, because I feel like a lot of those bluffs that I'm going to be making are specifically to exploit overfolds here. Right. Um, right. So maybe that's just part of the function of the and, solve is that they're not overfolding. Right. And maybe that gets back to Rob's point here is that the solver doesn't think people are overfolding, but we all kind of know from experience that monotone boards tend to scare people like n- no other. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think they're scarier than paired boards to most people. I think people get a little like um, more doubtful on paired boards and on monotone boards are like, Oh, you've, you've got it. You've got, if you're betting, you've got it. Um, so, um, maybe, maybe, you know, the exploit for, for us, unless we're in like a really elite field is that that's great for the solver to do this, but this is, I think with the ACE of hearts X, we should be betting. Mm Hmm. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. Yeah, play play the table you're sitting at, right? Like that's right. Like, put, put put make make good assumptions about your opponent and their hand range, and that's that's what poker is. Um, do we did it get much into uh, did did you look much at sort of their range that they check the flop with? Um, did you do much to sort of like think about how that in in the solve how that affects their holdings at this point? Um, y- yes, although that I, you know, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'll, I'll, as always solvers also are only as good as what you put into them. Mm. And I would say that that is certainly the murkiest part. I like, I don't, this was against sort of a very unknown player to me. I had like three hands on them in my history. So like, right. I, and it's so hard to know what people are, I mean, you say, Jim, that you, you lead when you have position on a board like this, you're leading a hundred percent of the time. Right. And so I don't know what people are, are people checking back a queen, 
you know, are, are people checking back um, their s- solo hearts? Are they checking back flushes? Um, what, yeah. What about you guys, John and Rob? When, when you're in position here and you still have the initiative from preflop and it comes monotone and you get checked to, uh, what are you thinking about? Are you, you know, with your entire range of hands there, are there parts of your hand that you, parts of your range that you want to check behind and parts that you want to play? So th- this is a time when I might be inclined to do the delayed C bl- bet. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had, let's say I have an ace queen here, um, I might check the flop because I anticipate that an opponent who has the flush, particularly if it's a weak flush, will bet out on the turn because they aren't going to want to go two streets without getting value. And if they check the turn, then I will do my delayed C bet on the turn. Mm -hmm. Um, I can see me very commonly playing it with that line. Yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't. I, <laughs> I think I like I like your logic, but I don't think I would play it that way. I I tend to play my range um, strongly. So if we've got a queen high, let's say it's a queen high rainbow board, the way it's laid out. I mean, you got that little potential uh, straight draw in there. Mm-hmm. But other than that, so I would play it almost the same. So if I had ace queen, I would typically – you know, C bet with my ace queen to try to extract some value early on in the hand. Most people don't believe you when you C bet the flop, they're going to call you on the flop and then they're going to wait to see what you do on the turn. They're going to check you on the turn. And if you bet again, they fold like cheap suits (laughs) or, or they actually have something and they call you again. And that's when they're, you know, people are very turn honest. Mm-hmm. I think uh, this is something that you hear from Sky Masuhachi a lot when he's he's talking. The seabed has become so common now that people don't believe it. Mm. So I have a tendency, if I have any kind of a hand or a bigger range advantage, I'm going to try to get some money on the flop when they're still – they still don't believe me. Mm. Because on the turn, if I wait to the turn, all of a sudden, then I bet that's when – I'm not going to get any value at all. So it's 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 a it's a sticky wicket as they say, right? <laughs> how are you gonna get some when you do have that strong hand or that strong range, how do you get paid? And and, and in way position, too long Rob, you're not gonna <laughs> Would you ever would you ever check a flush here? I mean I might. Mm-hmm. And um, as a slow play, mm-hmm. you know, because um but at the same time they're going to expect me to check a flush. So there's going to be times where I'm going to bet that flush mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With, and, and they're not going to believe me. So now I'm going to get paid. Right. So it's, it's, it, this is where the, it's the psychology more than the actual range mm, of the hands right. or the, you know, and everything else. It's how are you going to extract value from that opponent? How are you going to get paid? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see if uh, Jonathan little has anything to say about that. And then we'll come back and hit this up on a couple other fronts. Have you ever wondered whether you should call a preflop raise or three bet instead? What do you do when you have a flush draw? Do you raise it or do you just call? What do you do with ace king when you miss the flop? Are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? Well, my name is Jonathan Little and I am a two-time World Poker Tour champion and creator of PokerCoaching.com where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. Don't guess and don't stress. Just register for your free account at pokercoaching.com slash rec poker right now. Thank you, Jonathan Little. And I should also say, if you want to work with Steve Fredland, our founder and leader, uh, you can go to smallsmallbusiness.com. If you or anyone you know owns a small business, um, he's interested in helping you go to smallsmallbusiness.com. So um, I wanted to get at one point uh, that John said here recently, which is that he, if he's in position, he wants to go for that delayed C bet. And one of the things that makes it so helpful, so valuable, is that the, your opponent has now showed weakness on two streets. Um, and when, as John says, when they decline to bet that turn, um, he can confidently 
uh, f- make them fold a-, a lot of their garbage hands, which they have at that point um, with a small bet. And if, because we said all, all ourselves earlier, it's fairly uncontroversial to check the flop 100% of the time. What that means is that your range hasn't actually weakened much when all you've done is check the flop because you're checking the flop with almost 100% of your range. So even though you're sitting in position, there's this monotone flop, you've got aggression, um, the, the gym model of just betting a small amount 100% of the time, your opponent hasn't actually weakened the range. So if you really want to get those folds, do it in that delayed C-bet way that John recommends where you can more confidently uh, C-bet your, uh, your garbage there and get some folds because they've checked twice. Um, and obviously Rob's got the other end of the equation. If you're holding a value hand, you know, everyone's so suspicious of these, you know, the Jim Reed style C-bets um, that, yeah, you can, you can make that a value bet and get called by someone who's uh, going to fancy you for a, a blusterini. So it sounded like Chris, you're saying that there was very little leading at all. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, yeah, and, this, solvers yeah, tend, tended to take uh, a you know like a very small part of its range. Like I was saying, that sort of ace queen and nine eight as leads, and then m- almost ninety five something percent of hands were either check calls or check raises or check folds. Hmm. And that that really means, and then, and then, okay. So let's put ourselves in the villain's position here on the turn. Then, so it does check through the flop. Then your opponent checks again. I mean, I'm going to be betting a ton here, right? Mm-hmm. Like now they've really weakened their range to John's point, mm-hmm. and you know, I might even want to have like a value sizing and a bluff sizing here, because I think you're going to be able to leverage a lot of bluffs with a small sizing here. But I think you're actually going to want to make them pay a bit with your value hands if they're going to come mm-hmm. along. Cause they're there. The out of position players range is also very split right now. Um, they've got a lot of garbage that you can get to fold with a small bet. And then uh, a pretty small portion that's going to be continuing either as a check call or a check raise. Does that scan with what you guys have, have thought about it? So that delayed C bet that John recommends does seem like a, a great bluff spot there. Mm-hmm. And and that may be why the, I mean, the, the, the solvers seem to like to have, you know, a decent number of check raises here um, that we have uh, a number of flushes that are check raises. Um, some of our sets are check raises. Um, some of those ace hearts X are check raises, uh, much more than, than, than leads. Um, Hmm. yeah. And check raising is the more fun way to do it. So maybe the solver (laughs) just likes to get it in, you know, (laughs) it's more, it's definitely more fun to balance a check raising range than a donking range in my opinion. Right. (laughs) The, yeah, it's the, the only, Blusterini style solver. <laughs> the only the only issue I see with that in in the games, at least the games that I play, is that so often that board is going to get checked down all the way to the river, mm. and then whatever's in the pot in the middle is all you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the the check raising maybe with the bluffs makes a lot of sense. I think with the value hands, I think I prefer to bet out um, to try to get some you know, try to get some value when I can. Mm -hmm. So one thing it feels like is one of these general rules, you know, I like to love love to pull general rules out of this stuff is that these monotone flop boards are going to be pretty passively played as a rule. It seems like there's not going to be that much bluffing. (laughs) How can I even say that? That doesn't feel right. Um, but it feels like, or maybe it's just that it's going to be done on later streets. Later uh, streets. When, when ranges yeah. are better defined. Like, that that makes sense to me. Yep. And John made a comment in our last uh, podcast on, on the monotone flop that Keith Brandt was involved with. Hmm. And John talked about how you either are going to have a very small pot or you, somebody's going to have a flush and it's going to be a very big pot. So if you don't have the flop, flush you want to make sure it's a small pot <laughs> mm. <laughs> yep yep yeah. 
And then it's another one of those spots where you're likely to win a small pot uh, out of position and lose a big pot out of position too. If you, start, if you kind of get frisky with it. So um, mm-hmm. I can see that. I can see that. All right. Well, still st- we, we've been over this one a couple. We looked at it in a, in a study group. Um, this panel's gotten together to talk about this. It's a, it's a very interesting, tricky spot, monotone boards out of position. Who knew? It's just kind of hard, hard to play. Well, um, luckily, it's so much fun. We're going to play anyway. Thank you to Chris Jones, Rob Washam, John Somsky, uh, smallsmallbusiness.com, running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. Thanks. Thanks.